So now I'm going to review the Kaplan-Meier statistics. So the Kaplan-Meier curve is a non-parametric estimate of the survival function. All that means is that we're not trying to say, oh, this survival function follows an exponential distribution or a specific distribution, a specific shape. We're just defining the survival function. Whenever events occur, we define the survival function. So it's an empirical estimate of the survival function. It's just what is the probability of surviving past certain times in the sample, taking into account censoring. If there was no censoring, if people didn't uh, drop out of the study at different times, in fact, this would be a very easy thing to estimate. Uh, but the, the trick to Kaplan-Meier is that it's accommodating that censoring. And the Kaplan-Meier curves, we're going to draw some Kaplan-Meier curves. Those can be compared statistically to get a p-value with a log rank test. And a log rank test is just a type of chi-square test. So let me just show you how this works very briefly with a simple example. You have five subjects who start a study. And let's say that the first event that happens in the study is that subject E dies four months into the study. We're going to define the survival curve here um, right at four months, whenever events occur. So we're going to go to our curve. Our curve starts at 100%, but at four months, subject E dies. So we drop our curve. The survival probability now goes down to 80%. Four out of five survive that event time. Four out of five survive past four months. So our survival probability here is 80%. We drop the curve down to 80%. Let's say the next thing that happens is that subject A drops out after six months. They're censored at six months. We don't know if they went on to die in the last six months of the study, but we know that they uh, were alive through the first six months of the study. We're not going to change the curve because we don't know that anybody died there. But we're going to indicate that on the curve with a little mark. Then the, the next thing that happens is that subject C dies at seven months into the study. So that's another event. We're going to change the curve. We're going to drop the survival curve. The probability is down at seven months. Notice that I'm indicating at six months where subject A dropped out of the study with a little bar here. This indicates the censoring that somebody was uh, dropped out of the study. We drop our curve down at uh, seven months when subject C died. Now, the way that the censoring gets incorporated here is that right before seven months, at that time point, there were actually only three people at risk of dying. We're not going to count subject A in the denominator here because they were censored. So the way that subject A is getting incorporated here, the way that we're accounting for the fact that they were censored is that our denominator now is just three rather than four. So we say that two out of three survived this second interval from four to seven months. The survival probability for this second interval was two thirds, two out of three. And then let's say subject B and D survive all the way to the end of the study period and the study ends. So we just draw the curve over. We don't have anything else happen. Now, the Kaplan-Meier curve gives us a cumulative probability of survival. So we had we dropped the curve down here at, to 80%. 80% of people were surviving. Where did I drop the curve? I didn't tell you yet where I dropped the curve down here. So what where what percent what was my chance of survival? Where did I drop the curve down here? We to do that, we have to multiply together the probability of surviving the first interval, which was 4 fifths. You have to survive the first interval and the second interval to get the cumulative probability. The probability of surviving the second interval, remember, was 2 out of 3. So to get the cumulative probability of surviving past 7 months, we multiply 4 fifths times 2 thirds. That's a survival probability of 53%. So this curve is now at 53%. So our curve here is defined at just two time points when events occurred. There was an 80% probability of surviving past 4 months and a 53% probability of surviving past um, 7 months and through to the end of the study. We just multiply those intervals together, assuming that we have independence here to get the total probability of surviving uh, the whole uh, time. Notice that this Kaplan-Meier estimate of survival takes into account censoring. The 53% that we've estimated the probability of surviving past the year is kind of a compromise between two other possibilities. We started the study with five people. We know that two people died. So if you were not accounting for censoring, you could just say, well, uh, there was three out of five people who survived the study. So maybe a, a rough guess at the survival probability would be 60%. On the other hand, you might look at it uh, with the sort of glass half uh, empty 
and you might say, well, uh, you know, actually, I only know that two survived past the year. I don't know what happened to the third one, so I'm going to say that the survival probability is only 40%, and maybe it's a little higher than 40%, but I might make a guess of 40%. So my bounds here is I could either estimate, if I wasn't accounting for sensory, I could either estimate the probability of survival uh, for a year to be 40% because I only saw two survive the year, or I could estimate it to be 60% uh, because I only saw two die. It's going to be somewhere in between there. So notice that the 53% from the Kaplan-Meier estimate is a good compromise between those two. Let me do uh, go through a real example of doing a Kaplan-Meier curve. This is we're going to just look at a single curve for one group of women. I'm going to make a happy route hip come here rather than death. We're going to talk about time to conception for women who are trying to get pregnant or having trouble. The uh, failure, therefore, is a good thing. The event is a good thing. So there were 38 women who were treated for infertility with a certain treatment, and we are trying to track their time to pregnancy. All the women were followed for up to two years to describe time to conception, and the event is conception. So we're starting with 100% of women not being pregnant, <coughs> and women survive until they conceive. And so the event here is conception. It's a, it's a positive outcome. So here's all the data. It's a nice data set because it just writes out all, we can see all the data. These are the women who had the event, these are the women who did not have the event, and this is the timing of it. So here's the Kaplan-Meier curve that corresponds to these data. And everywhere you see a little star, that's just where a woman was censored. She dropped out of the study before she became pregnant. So we start at 100% and it drops down from there. Remember, we want the curve to drop here. We want where the women are trying to get pregnant. The survival function is a stepwise function with nine event times. There's nine unique steps on this curve. That defines the survival probabilities. Again, we only define the survival probabilities where we actually see events. So let me just show you, walk you through how this is calculated. Again, a computer will do this for you, but it's nice to have some concept of what's going on here. So the first thing, the first month, and women can only get pregnant once a month, right? So the first month, the first cycle, uh, there were six women who conceived. So they all had events in the first cycle. So we can represent under the curve, six women conceived in the first menstrual cycle, therefore 32 out of 38 survived pregnancy-free past the first month. So we drop the curve down here. Uh, the survival probability of not getting pregnant is 84%. So we drop the curve down to 84%. That's the survival probability of making it past one month without getting pregnant. Second thing that happens is in the second month, we had five women who conceived. Now there is one woman who was censored after two months. I'll just, I'm going to call her 2.1 so we don't get confused. So there, were, I had written down that a woman can, uh, was censored at two months. That means she made it through two months. We know she didn't get pregnant in the second month. So her censoring is going to happen after uh, the second month. How do I represent this on the curve? Well, I'm going to drop down the curve. Five women conceived in the second month. What was the risk set? How many women were at risk of conceiving in the second month? There were 32 women. We started with 38. Six got pregnant in the first month. 32 are left. Therefore, 27 out of 32, eight, about 84% again, survived the second month pregnancy-free. To get the cumulative probability of survival, we have, to add, we have to multiply together the probability of surviving the first month times the probability of surviving the second month. We multiply those two probabilities together, I get a total probability, a cumulative probability of surviving pregnancy free past the second month of 71%. So I drop the curve down to 71%. Next thing, in the third month, we have uh, three women who conceive. One woman is censored in between the second and the third month. So we have to, uh, she is not going to be included in the risk set. She was not at risk of getting pregnant in the third month because she was dropped out. So there were only 26 women who are at risk of getting pregnant in month three. Out of those, three got pregnant, 23 did not. So the survival probability is 23 out of 26, or 88.5%. Again, we have to multiply that with the other ones to get the total probability of surviving past three months pregnancy pre. We drop our curve down now to 62.8%. In the uh, fourth month, we had one person who was censored at month three. So the, at the fourth month, our risk set was down to 22 women. Three get pregnant, 19 did not get pregnant. We're going to do the same thing. Now our probability uh, is down to 54%. And we can keep going with this. You get the idea. <clears throat> at uh, six months, their risk set is 18 women. So 88.8% survived this next interval pregnancy free. We're going to drop the curve now down to 42.9%. That's your probability of surviving past six months 
pregnancy free in this study. And I'm, I got bored here and, and decided to just scroll ahead when you get down to uh, 13 months. The probability now is down to 22%. And I just want to point out what happens at the end of a Kaplan-Meier curve. So at um, 13 months, the probability was 22%. That dropped rapidly down to 15%. So there was kind of a big drop off here at 16 months. But that drop just represents that there were three women left in the study and one got pregnant and you get a big drop in the curve just from three women. So as you get to the end of Kaplan-Meier curves, you're, you're often down to a very small number of women. You have to be a little bit careful about interpreting the end of the Kaplan-Meier curve. Things get wiggly. So two women did not conceive. Uh, that tail of that curve represents that there's just two women who s remain pregnancy free for the rest of the study. And it, it doesn't represent a lot because it's only two women. So again, at the end of the study, at the last event occurred at 16 months, and then at, the very, that, at that point there was only three women left. Two didn't get pregnant, one did. So this is, you can imagine that our estimates are getting very wiggly. There's a lot of uncertainty when you get down to such small numbers. So just keep that in mind with the end of uh, Kaplan-Meier curves. Uh, finally, we can also compare Kaplan-Meier curves between two or more groups. And here's an example of two groups. Researchers randomized 44 patients with hepatitis to receive either a steroid or no treatment. And then they compared the survival curves. And here's the raw data. In this case, I've got two groups. So I'm indicating censoring with a little red star. Uh, so somebody who has a little red star means that they were censored at that time. People who don't have the star had the event at that time. I'm not going to go through the drawing of these two curves, but it would be in the same way that I just uh, showed you. And here's the resulting Kaplan-Meier curve. So the red is the control group. They're dying off faster. The outcome here is death. And the steroid group is doing a lot better. Are those two curves statistically different? That's one question we're going to want to answer when we're comparing groups. It's a little misleading to the eye, because if you look at these two curves, you might think, oh, well, the two curves are converging at the end, right? The two curves seem to join back together at the end. There seems to be a big divergence, and then they seem to, to come back together. But remember, at the end of a Kaplan-Meier curve, there's a lot of, there's very few people left. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. If you were to dry, draw confidence intervals, those estimates would be very wide. So at this little jump, you this drop, this big drop you're seeing in the uh, steroid curve at the end, that just represents there were only three people left. Uh, and one of them died and two of them remained. So the survival probability, you're multiplying the curve by 2 thirds, which is a big f fraction. You're, you're really uh, dropping the curve quite a bit here just due to one person dying. Also, there's only just six people left in the uh, placebo uh, control group that um, just happened to survive the rest of the study. So that represents that long curve at the end just represents six people. So you have to be a little careful about over-interpreting the ends of Kaplan-Meier curves. They can get pretty wiggly with such small numbers. So I ran a log rank test on these data in a, a computer package. Actually doing the log rank test by hand is pretty tedious. Uh, but a log rank test compares those two curves. It compares them across all the time points at once. It's a chi-square test. It's a chi-square test with one degree of freedom. Again, I'm not going to go into the exact details of the test, but it's a chi-square test with one degree of freedom. It did come out to be statistically significant here, saying that the over all those time points, there is a significant difference between the two groups.